experimental mathematicians your ones up ago who will speak about mathematics is indeed a religion, but it has too many sects. Let's unite under a new god of experimental mathematics. Once upon a time, indeed, mathematics was religion, or at least mathematics was a subset of religion. The only people who knew mathematics were the priestly class. And they had all the fun. But this was a long, long time ago only applied mathematics. About 2,500 years ago, pure mathematics became a religion. The Pythagorean school worshipped numbers. Numbers were gods. Everything was a number. Everything was either a number or the ratio of a number. They tacitly assumed they knew for sure it was so obvious that every number you can think of is a ratio of two integers. There was a religion and they deeply believed in it. Then some wise guy called Hippasus came up with an apparent counterexample. He came up with a certain number. The square root of two, or rather length, that he proved that cannot be expressed as a ratio of two integers. And there was a very big crisis in this religion. They were sure that they gonna fix this apparent bug in a few weeks, and they asked him to keep quiet. But he was a bad boy, and he taught everybody, and I don't blame them for drowning him, or excommunicating him, or whatever the story goes. He fully deserved it. He should keep it in the family. And indeed, his contradiction, apparent contradiction, is an apparent contradiction. There was a very good way to get out of this apparent contradiction. Thus say that the square root of two is not a number. By definition, a number is the quotient of any two integers. These are only the only numbers that matter. So they didn't think about this this way, but too bad uh, they could have kept it. So the Pythagorean people, 2,500 years, tacitly assumed that every number is a quotient of two integers. And now we make fun of them. How stupid of them. But we, not we, not myself, I mean the collective we, almost everybody except for myself and a few other crazy people, believe that current mathematicians, mainstream mathematicians, are even more ridiculous. They have their own dogmas, their own things that they take for granted. One thing is that of mathematical knowledge. What do they mean by mathematical knowledge? And I'm talking about mathematicians, real mathematicians, professional mathematicians. Before we can talk about mathematical knowledge, we have to talk about knowledge. I assume that you already know what mathematical means. But what is knowledge? If you look at the dictionary definition uh, of the philosopher, philosophers, knowledge is justified true belief. This is what knowledge is. So mathematical knowledge is justified mathematical true belief. And what I think is completely ridiculous is what most mathematicians take to be justified. They think justified means a fully, completely, rigorous, logically impeccable proof. And because of this dogma, mathematics has been slowed down. We always think, oh, how great we are 
all for Matla Siorem, the Poka conjecture, we saw great cave mathematicians. There was nothing that compared to what could have been done without this dogma of saying that justified knowledge is a rigorous proof. I just went to a conference and every time you hear the phrase, we now know a famous number theory, number theory, sorry, from Stanford, a, a very, very long name that I don't know how to pronounce, but it starts with sound. And his nickname is sound, a very great number theorist that I really like, uh, in spite of his uh, fanatical and uh, mistaken religious views. <laughs> Some of my best friends are deeply religion, religious, so uh, I admire him very, very much. But what I was very, very amused when he talked about the Goldbach conjecture, he said, we now know that and for him, we now know means we now have a completely rigorous proof. So this guy, Professor Sound and Blank, knows that every sufficiently large odd integer is a sum of three prime numbers. This is the theorem of Vinogradov. But he does not know the Goldbach conjecture. For him, it's only a conjecture until it's proven rigorously that every even integer can be written a bigger than four, a bigger equal to four, can be written a bigger than four, as a sum of two primes, it's, he doesn't know it! It's only a conjecture. In contrast, I know it very, very well. I am, I know, that the Goldbach conjecture is true, I know it much better than I know my name. The probability that the Goldbach conjecture is true is much larger than my parents would be, and that I really, my true name is a different name, uh, or that I exist. It's very, very, not very possible, but it's slightly possible. It's much more possible uh, that we are all in a dream of a giant or in some video game of some hacker in some other planet and uh, then that the Goldbach conjecture is false. And also this guy, uh, Professor Sound, uh, Canon Sound, uh, Blank, does not know the Riemann hypothesis. I know the Riemann hypothesis, 100%. It's true with 100% certainty the Riemann hypothesis is true. I also know for sure that P is not equal to and B. There's no doubt about it. In a talk last week, somebody said, hey, well, we don't know yet. So somebody said, they don't know whether P equals NP. Well, they should have said, we don't know of a formal proof that P is not equal to NP. But that P equals NP is much more certainty uh, that E equals MC spell or F equals MA or you name it. Another stupid thing that people don't know, but I know, is the following. Mathematicians know that this infinite series converges, and it's not a rational number. They know that. This is go back to Euler. They also know that this is not a rational number. This is much more recent since 1978. A big breakthrough by Appery. Roger Appery. A good story. But pure mathematicians do not know whether this is irrational. They do not they have no clue whether or not this is irrational. They do know that E is irrational. They do know that pi is not a rational number. But pure mathematicians have no clue whether or not e plus pi is irrational. They only conjecture it, but they have no idea whether it's true or not. Because that's stupid. I know for sure 
that these are irrational numbers e plus pi and e times, e times pi. I don't have a formal proof, but I know for sure. So I think that we should get rid of the hang up of saying, knowing something, uh, and proving something. We want truth. Mathematics is a science. And we want to maximize their mathematical knowledge in a more general sense. So, uh, excuse yes. me, so e plus pi is, is, is not known, it's rational, right? <laughs> it's no! <laughs> no. There's no formal proof no, no. that e times pi is known. But the fact is known to me. It's not known to an average mathematician, because an average religious fanatic mathematician equates knowledge to having a formal proof. But this is, in my opinion, a, a stupid religious superstition. <laughs> because why, how do I know that e plus pi uh, is irrational? Why should it be rational? There's no reason in the whole world that it should be rational. Uh, how many real numbers are they? Aleph. How many rational numbers are they? Aleph zero. Aleph zero of Aleph is a very, very tiny zero. The probability that if we take any randomly chosen uh, uh, real number uh, that it is uh, irrational is, is very, very of course, you can cook up artificial examples. E plus 2 uh, plus 2 minus E. That's irrational, that's irrational, and the sum, so this is artificial. Here you have a good reason why it's not irrational plus irrational, irrational. But here, E and pi are so far apart, there's no good reason why it should be. So it's so obvious. Uh, of course, I'm not saying it's a waste of time to try to find. It's not a complete, it's a waste of time, but not a complete waste of time. Playing chess is not a waste of time. It's fun, it's a challenge, but it's not a science. People should not get paid for it. People should do it in the spare time. Or if you are a professional chess player, some people should get it. It's a really, it's a really true grandmaster in mathematics. Maybe 10 top great, uh, maybe Perlman and Andrew Wiles, they can get paid for proving rigorously things like in chess. Uh, but right now we pay, I don't know, 50,000 mathematicians uh, uh, to do this thing. And they can invest their time and get the taxpayers' money much more efficiently by looking for mathematical knowledge in the more general sense. So another thing, our age. So for me, our age, Goldbach, and these things are much more certainly true than Fermat's theorem and the Poincaré conjecture. Fermat's theorem, the only proof is very, very long. And the number of people who actually read it cover to cover and understand everything is probably two or three. Uh, and maybe five things, uh, because five things had a motivation. Uh, he was desperately to find a mistake. He was hoping to do it himself. So he was so desperate. He, so it's pretty safe that, uh, so, with probability 99%, this is true, the Fermat theorem, because five things uh, tried to find a mistake, and he couldn't. By the way, the guy who helped Andrew Wiles to prove it at the end uh, is coming tomorrow to give a talk uh, right here at 4 uh, p.m. But it's a different thing. And the uh, Poincaré conjecture by Perlman uh, is probably true the proof is probably okay. People checked it very carefully, and they were desperate to find mistakes. That human nature uh, to be famous by finding a mistake. The best way to get famous is to prove a, a conjecture. But if you're not good enough to prove conjecture, you look at somebody else's thing and you find a mistake, uh, and then you get a little bit famous. So they tried very hard, and they couldn't. So it's 99.9% true from the theorem. I'm not saying it's probably false. It's probably true. But the Riemann hypothesis, the Goldberg conjecture, and these things, are the probability that are true are much, much larger than the probability that, uh, that, they, uh, that this is uh, that, uh, the Fermat theorem and Poincaré conjecture. Because the proofs at the world are very long, and only a few people check them. Uh, yes, Tom? Is there empirical proof that Fermat theorem is equivalent to the empirical proof of the others? Yeah, I know. I know. I don't know. 
So, uh, so, so speaking of religion, the, before there were, like in religion, sometimes you have, I'm sorry, schism. So after the crisis, the 2,500 years ago, about in the early 1900s, there was another big uh, split, the little split in mathematics. You had Hilbert, and you had uh, Bravo. No. How do you spell it? W something. Yeah. UW. No. Or EW? UW. UW. Or oh. oh, U. Yeah. And they were really were very, very emotional about it. Hilbert famously revolutionized mathematics by introducing existence proofs. In the 19th century was a big activity of proving so-called the fundamental theorem of invariance. Never mind what it is. It's some algebraic construction, uh, some algebraic uh, concept, uh, object called invariant. And, uh, and somebody called Paul Gordon proved a special case in a very complicated proof. The Hilbert, all of a sudden, this young uh, upstart Hilbert came up with a much more general existence proof. He did not actually exhibit, he did not give an algorithm, but using indirect means, he found an existence proof. And the story goes that when Paul Gordon, the myth goes, that when he saw Hilbert's quick proof, he was very upset. And he said, he famously said, this is not mathematics, this is theology. Uh, this is the famous quote. The true story and the, the mythology that people, people think he was very upset and hostile to Hilbert's proof. Well, the true story, he was a very nice man, he was very generous, and he liked Hilbert very much, and when he said this famous quote, this is not mathematics, this theology, he meant it as a joke, uh, uh, and only uh, half criticism. So he was a good guy, and he also was a good loser. He was not a sole loser. Uh, so I like him very much. But of course, he had a grain of truth, but he was a nice guy. This guy was not such a nice guy. And he got uh, very, very emotional, and he said that most of the proofs of Hilbert and others using indirect arguments, existent proofs, are not kosher, are not valid. They are completely nonsensical. A proof is valid only if you can construct it, a constructive proof. So you have the classical logic, and Bravo started an intu intuitionist logic, also called constructive logic. So many proofs that Hilbert would consider perfectly legit, Brau would consider. So that's an example of a religious split in the early 19th century. Nowadays, only logicians care about this and this whole school of logicians that do this. But as far as mainstream mathematics goes, eh, they don't worry about this. This debate is now old, old news. Eh? So let me illustrate with a beautiful example uh, the difference between this and this. But before that, many number theorists use indirect proof all the time. They use the so-called law of the excluded middle. That is intuitively obvious, but not as a intuition is, it's not in intuitively obvious. To be or not to be, it's one or the other. Is it true? So, 
The number theory, there is a euphemism for a proof that uses this. It's called an ineffective proof. And my next door neighbor, Hedrick Ivanez, is a master in ineffective proofs. So it's considered cons com completely legit. It gets published in the Annals of Mathematics, uh, all the uh, high power journals. And if you have an effective proof, it's all the better. So you can have a paper and effective proof. So there are two kinds of proof. Effective is considered a little bit better than ineffective. But ineffective proof is completely legit according to classical mainstream mathematics. One example is the Gauss class field conjecture, whatever it is. I forgot what it is, but what I do remember, it goes as follows. Case one, case two. Case one, the so-called generalized Riemann hypothesis is true. Then some guy, maybe it was Don Jaguer, I don't remember, proved it, yes. If the GR8 is true, then they have a proof. Case two, the GR8 is false. Then using a completely different argument, some other guy, I think it was Dorian Goldfeld, uh, or maybe it was the other way around, proved it. Obviously, we don't know whether GR8, we don't even know whether R8 is true. So we don't know whether GR8 is true. We have no clue whether GR8 is true or false. But obviously, it's one or the other. Exclude the middle, there's no way. So, UED. So this uses a dichotomy. True or false? Yes or no? Can or no? Yeah or the nine? <laughs> but this is not true. This dichotomy, according to intuitionists and myself, is really a trichotomy. Now, three possible things, not as two. You can be true, every sentence could be true, and false, and more statements are neither true nor false. They are meaningless, gibberish. We don't know yet whether GR8 is true or false or gibberish. It's a distinct possibility that it is gibberish, because a priori it is gibberish. Why? because it's a statement about infinite objects, an infinite set. Every statement that involves quantifiers, and the quantifying is over an infinite set, is a priori meaningless. Very often, it could be made a posteriori meaningful by proving it for symbolic A N. For example, the following. Deep theorem, m plus one square equals n square plus two n plus one. For every integer n, we go equal to zero. Is a priori meaningless because it has this quantifier for every n. There does not exist infinity many numbers. But you can make it meaningful by saying for every symbolic n, for the symbol. And now, maybe can do it very, very fast, and also even you can do it very, very fast, and prove it for a symbol, and using the laws of algebra, true for symbols. And if it's true for symbols, it's true for any numbers that they exist. But they're only, according to my philosophy, finally many numbers, many, 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 many of them. M more than you can ever imagine, but still finally many. So that's an example of an a priori, meaning less statement that could be made a posteriori, meaningful by giving a proof. But since there is no yet proof of the RH, 
It's an open question whether it's true, false, or meaningless. So this proof is not.